Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Children's Commission, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webcast on treatment family foster care, also known as TFFC. This presentation has been designed by the Department of Family and Protective Services for judges, attorneys, and CASA volunteers. Our speakers today are Lauren Morgan, Department of Family and Protective Services Program Lead, Caroline Sinha, Department of Family and Protective Service Systems Improvement Analyst, Dr. Valerie Jackson, Monarch Family Services Owner and Administrator, and Michael Scribner, CK Family Services Senior Director of Family Services. This presentation is an hour and a half long, and we will reserve the last 30 minutes for questions. If you have any questions at any point during the presentation, please submit it using the Q&A function, and the speakers will answer them at the end of the presentation. If there are any questions we are unable to get to during the live presentation, the speakers will send written answers to the commission, and the commission will post the responses on our website along with the archive webcast and the PowerPoint presentation. MCLE information will be provided at the conclusion of the webcast, and I'll now turn it over to Lauren to begin our presentation. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Welcome Treatment to the treat Foster Family Care, Care webinar. webinar. My name is Lauren name Morgan, is Morgan, Morgan program, the Federal Specialist, Specialist State, State, Office, State Office, and I manage the TFFC program. program. So I'm going to present to you all today, today on, on our, our model, model here, here at DFTS, at DFTS and, and just go over the program as a whole and how that relates to you all. To you all. Um, okay, so let me back up. A little background on how uh, we got here. Um, in 2017, during the 85th legislative session, treatment foster care was a new service created to be used by the department for a special subset of children. So the program would serve as an alternative to congregate care settings and allow children to be in a foster home setting instead. And you can move to the next slide now, Dylan. Um, so in 2017, the Texas Administrative Code defined TFFC and listed the requirements for the program. Uh, first three contracts were awarded to three providers, and that was Arrow, Bear, and CK. And one year later, uh, the first child was placed in the program through Bear Child Placing Agency. Next slide. So what is TFC? TFC is a type of foster care that provides specialized treatment for children with emotional and behavioral needs. The target population for this program is children in our conservatorship with very high needs and complex trauma history that require treatment services. It's a short-term program uh, only intended to last nine to 12 months. TFC programs recruit and train foster families who are are equipped to provide a therapeutic environment for kids who require just more intensive care than traditional foster care can usually provide. Um, it's the kind of program for kids who are, be who are being recommended into an RTC or they're cycling in and out of psychiatric hospitals. So for example, um, an eight-year-old or one of the teenagers that I'm sure you have on your docket with severe behavioral issues. Um, they have maybe a specialized or intense level of care and they're being recommended to go into a residential treatment center, but maybe they don't do well around that amount of kids. So this type of home would be uh, serve them well. And next slide. So another um, big hallmark of this program is treatment planning. Uh, TFFC includes a large treatment team, so not just the child, the caseworker, the foster parent, but the potential permanent caregiver, who they're going to next, the case manager, the therapist, the treatment coordinator, um, and then just really anyone in that child's life who plays a significant role. So family member, CASA, um, attorney ad litem, school staff, really anyone. Um, everyone works together to create a plan that responds to the needs uh, of the child and family with the goal of supporting the child and working towards stepping them down to a less restrictive and permanent placement. So success in this program really is a team effort 
um, with lots of communication and collaboration during and after placement. Uh, we also provide support services to the families and kids, including counseling, case management. Um, and the goal, again, is just to help these kids achieve stability, improve their mental health, and develop positive relationships with their current and future families. Next slide. So these are our um, eligibility requirements. So they need to be 17 years or younger um, in our conservatorship. And then one of those, meeting one of those uh, qualifications at the bottom. So some of the types of characteristics of a child who may be a good fit for the program would be kids with nonviolent or violent behaviors, frequent physical uh, aggression, maybe they're withdrawn, antisocial, um, engaging in self-injurious behaviors or having suicidal ideations or attempts. Um, the kids uh, that qualify probably sound like a lot of the kids that you all see in your courts every day. Next slide. So this is a comparison chart of what you get in a traditional foster home and in a TFFC foster home. So Kids in the TFFC program get just a lot more wraparound support and services uh, than a traditional. So for example, um, there's a TAC rule in place that uh, in the TFFC program, there's a limited number of children that can be in that home when at least one is um, getting that TFFC service. So if one is already in the home as TFFC, there can only be one other foster child in the home at all times. And that just keeps the number to one or two more focused on their, those kids with the high needs. Um, another example is the amount of training the foster parent gets compared to a traditional foster parent. Um, you just get uh, more hours, for example, CK, or I believe all, all of the providers receive at least 12 more hours of training to become a treatment family foster care foster parent. Um, another big difference is just the support that traditional versus TFC receives. Um, for example, with, with therapy that just comes with TFFC while in a traditional home um, that most of the time has to be located by CPS or the foster family or whatever provider um, is that child's home they're in. Next slide. So moving on to discharge and transition. Um, the focus in TFC is always, always next placement. So where is the child gonna go next? Um, from the very start, what the outcomes show is that these kids do better in less restrictive settings. And although TFC is a home setting and isn't congregate care, it isn't an RTC, it's still more restrictive technically so these TFC homes are unique as the focus is engaging the next caregiver in the service planning and the coordination from the very beginning, if, if that's possible. Um, the treatment team will bring in that identified caregiver into the treatment plan meetings that happen every 60 days, um, provide them with coaching resources, and then aftercare resources that are uh, six months after they leave the home just to ensure the child, uh, their needs continue to be met and that they're successful when they leave the program. So the goal, of course, um, in any placement is transitioning a child to a family member or caregiver who has been working with the TFC team throughout the placement. So if that isn't identified, then the goal is just to step down to a regular traditional foster home. Uh, aftercare, huge part of the program. Um, these support services are part of it to make sure the tr transition out of the TFC home goes smoothly. This goes back to the Family First Prevention Services Act and the fact that best practice states 
kids are best served if they're followed when they leave treatment. So all of our TFC providers provide six months of this aftercare support. Next slide. So consistent with our mission over here, the TFC's program vision is that all kids in care can have their needs met by relatives or those with whom they have a family-like relationship. So this has always been our policy, but the concept of TFFC kinship is pretty new. Um, and we do have a speaker later on who's going to discuss uh, more about that. Next slide. So moving on to what the providers do, and they do a lot. Um, this is only a snapshot. Our TFC providers are the ones on the ground providing all of these unique services and support. So 24 hour supervision, individualized therapeutic services, case management, wraparound services. Um, they're in the home or in the community, in the school, at least weekly seeing the child. So, so they're doing lots for this family and child to make sure they're getting their needs uh, and services set. Next slide. So the foster parents. Um, to become a TFC foster parent, there are some mandated criteria. The first one is um, they're both in the Texas Administrative Code. And the first is that one or two foster parents uh, who are highly trained to meet the specific needs of this child population. Um, the CPAs are responsible for training and certifying them as being able to provide these intense treatment services. Um, the newest thing that was added was uh, single parents can qualify now as long as they meet this uh, definition of quality care. Um, and if there are ever, ever any concerns about a single parent not meeting the needs, then the contractor can always um, reevaluate. All right. So moving on to legal consideration, this is where you all come in. Um, child placing agencies are using evidence-based models that have the research to show that nine to 12 months in this program is really needed for a successful discharge. So it's very important that these kids are staying in the program for that full time frame, be at least nine months to get that treatment. So that gives everybody the time to engage in services and inevitably it's setting the child up for a successful future out of the foster care system. Um, continuing on about that, discharging early from the program may put the child at risk of regression. Um, the adoption may uh, become unsuccessful. I've seen that a couple of times. They're coming back into care. Um, or just the caregiver is just not properly prepared for the child's behaviors or needs. Um, and we at state office can always assess any child, a judge or attorney or CASA may uh, be, thinks that they may be a good fit for the program. So a court order is not necessary. We are happy to review any child y'all think might be a good fit. And um, once QRTP gets off the ground running, TFC would be a great step down program for one of those youth who are leaving that program. So data and outcomes, um, it's another part of the program and that just helps us look at what's working, what's not. Uh, there's always ongoing data collection and analysis of the program. Um, and someone from our state office team, uh, data and research team is gonna present on this today as well. But in short, as you can see, a child stepping down into a less restrictive placement is always best. So placement back with parent, an adoptive home, foster family, kinship, those are the things that, those are the types of places we wanna see these kids uh, step down into. And so now we're gonna watch a short video on the program um, coming from people uh, who, are, who are on the ground. I really think it, it's not just um, our agency, but the state of Texas. The fact that we 
the legislature was willing to move in a direction with treatment foster care to say, we see children are not getting the services that they need on the same level that matches what their needs are. And we want to empower foster homes, foster families, and foster agencies across the state to be able to do that. Uh, the trend that was noticed was that children are bouncing through the system. So a child, it goes from one foster home to the next, to the next. Uh, maybe they, uh, in between homes, are in and out of psychiatric hospitals. Uh, and then all that starts to build up. So then it becomes harder and harder for the state to place a child. So then you end up with children that are going into residential treatment or congregate care, because those are the only places that, because of how the children read on paper, think they can handle the children's behavior. And so we wanted to break that cycle. Being that with our treatment services, children can finally be able to be themselves and be connected with people who truly love them and especially finding that own connection with themselves. Um, it's really important for our kiddos to find that felt safety and I'm hoping that with our services, which includes individual therapy and behavioral health support services, um, a lot of visits from their treatment team, they're able to find that connection with others and they're able to see themselves for how we and other people see them, which is worthy of love and worthy of life. To be part of a team, uh, there was going to be uh, you and, and the, the therapist and the behavior support specialist, you were gonna have a lot of help and that's what I really liked. I thought, okay, if I can't do this, I'm gonna have someone to lean, lean on. We have uh, two things. We have uh, uh, BCMT and we have TBRI. So they teach us how to um, redo things with the kids. Uh, we offer compromises. Uh, we DS. They don't have to do it alone. We're not asking them to do it alone. It's a whole team um, that, that works together. Um, and so, you know, we as, as the as the agency that provides treatment care provides certain members of that team, like a care coordinator who does wraparound meetings. We provide, you know, a uh, qualified mental health professional who does skills training with both the child and the foster parent and the permanency family that we're identifying for that child. Comprises of an individual therapist, a behavioral support specialist, a clinical case manager of of course the cps worker um, a casa worker and the foster family themselves and of course in the center of all this team is the child the child themselves we have one support group for every family traditional in treatment that meets once a month but then we also have um, a ptfc lunch where the treatment families come in for lunch that respite amongst each other meaning if hey, I am going out of town, or me and my wife want to have a date night, can you watch my watch the child? Then they can kind of interconnect in those ways and at those meetings. I get frustrated when I hear those of us in the system saying the child has to be ready to be adopted or the child has to be ready to go home. These are children who are in the system at no fault of their own because of things that have happened to them, really traumatic things. Um, and what we need to find is an adult who's willing to do what it takes to help that child heal. Now that's what I do. I fight with the school. I fight to make sure he's going to be able to play football. He's going to be able to run track. He's going to get what he needs and be able to accomplish those dreams that we all got to do because our parents were normal and we just went through school and we did what we wanted and we made our achieved our goals. and. He went to nine different schools for eighth grade, so he never got to do anything. So this is ninth grade year. This is his year. He's, I'm, not, I'm not gonna let him leave this school. We drive uh, an extra distance to take him to this school because it's in his mother's school district. So if he reunifies that way, we won't have to switch schools again. He can keep the same friends and stay on the same teams. Um, and it's important to us to keep him, give him that stability. How is this child doing in the community? How are they engaging with peers and adults? Um, I have a lot of kids that go to day camps and something as easy, when we're looking at that, that's easy to go to day camp. But when we have a kid that doesn't feel safe 
or has never interacted with peers in a healthy manner, that's a big step to achieve to go to a day camp for all day. And then even in the school system, we have a lot of kids that, you know, they were absent for most of that time because of what was going on at their home. And so you, getting, I had a kid that went to school for, their, uh, for an entire year, and that was their first time that they did that. That was a big achievement. And they were in the fifth grade at that point. We have had several children in our treatment program uh, bond with their treatment parents, and our contractors have, have, have agreed to extend the treatment care into extended foster care. When uh, she first got to my house, you know, uh, she would immediately explode. You know, she has a lot of emotional dysregulation. So she would immediately explode, and, and so it, we would go down that path. And now, when she feels herself, she can, she can catch herself now. When she's escalating or getting agitated, she'll start to breathe. And I'll look over, and there she is taking her little deep breaths. Or She can actually now even remove herself from a situation if she gets upset. I had a four-year-old um, prior to coming into care with us, she was diagnosed with autism. Um, I'm not sure on where she fell on the spectrum, but she was nonverbal, um, never went to school. And we put her inside this home and within three or within the first two weeks, she actually learned how to use sign language to let others know her needs and wants. And then we got her into occupational therapy, we got her into speech therapy, and we got her into physical therapy. Um, she spent nine months with us. She learned how to talk. She was um, she was still getting potty training down, but we had an app on a phone that had an avatar that walked her through the steps. So she was actually watching that. Um, and what led her into care was that it was around COVID and her mom just had to keep working but could not provide the adequate care for her. So that's what led her into this program. And while she was with us, mom found a job. Um, we connected her with services. And when the mom and daughter were unified at the end of our nine month program, she had access to the same occupational therapy, speech therapy, and physical therapy that the young girl had with us. We connected her with all those services. So I did a six month follow up and she remained in the home with mom. And to this day, they're doing great. And the young girl is going to school and doing really, really well. She's even singing karaoke. Our 18 year old, you know, we've had him since he was 16. He'll be 19 in a couple of months. <laughs> um, he's going to be going to college. He graduated. He made it to college. He, he was an athlete. Um, he's transformed in our home. So when he came, he was on five different medications, psychotropic meds, um, uh, anxiety, ADHD meds. Um, and he was, a lot of those meds make you carry weight. So he was, he wasn't fat, but he was thick. He was puffy and he was angry and sad all at the, all the time. So we took the first few months to start weaning him off his meds so we could see what he looked like with nothing by uh, we got him in june by october we had him off all his meds so it took a couple of months to clear out his system and by january i had a different kid on my hands he was alert active um, he was losing weight he realized that he was a good looking kid we got him in the gym now he is um pushing 200 pounds but it is all solid muscle he's he's beautiful he's he knows he's beautiful um <laughs> And he's very proud of his hard work person. And I mean, if we only change one kid's life, it's definitely worth it. And hopefully we, we've changed more than just one, but one is worth it. Every kid deserves a home. Every kid deserves a home. And a lot of these kids have, uh, you know, behavioral needs and they just need to be heard, you know, you just need to give them a chance. There we go. And these are just some TFFC resources that we can uh, make sure to get to you all today after the training. Um, we've got the external website that we've created um, for TFFC, the Texas Administrative Code, 
and then um, the TFFC mailbox. And on the next slide, it's my contact information um, and the associate director of placement and the director of placement services. So thank you all so much for listening. And I will now pass it on to my colleague, Caroline, who will go over data and how that relates to TFC. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, so I wanted to go over some of the numbers for treatment foster family care. Uh, I'm super glad that Lauren has set us up amazingly. So you guys have some good context. You've heard from the treatment foster parents uh, to see their perspectives. I think anytime you're looking at numbers, it's really, really important to understand the context behind what we're seeing. Uh, as I always say, a number is just a number until you add context to it. Um, so I'm hoping I can give you some background as far as the data is concerned. And there's sort of three main areas that we're gonna be looking at. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the child demographics, uh, foster parent feedback and program outcomes. Uh, and as a side note, um, I, I sometimes I say treatment foster care instead of treatment family foster care. I use those interchangeably. So if you randomly see TFC instead of TFFC, that's why it's the same thing. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So next slide. So first I wanted to give a breakdown of the kids in treatment family foster care. This is data as of May 4th of this year. Um, I pulled it from our uh, daily placements table to figure out like what the demographics were for all of our kids that were actively in a treatment family foster care home on May 4th. Um, so when I pulled that information, uh, looking at age, the largest age group is between six to 10 years old. So, you know, surprisingly, these are pretty young kids. I think a lot of people, when they think, um, you know, high needs, they're thinking those late teenagers, right? Um, the, the 16, 17 year olds. Uh, and realistically, a lot of treatment foster care kids are a little bit younger, which can make it really difficult for them to really thrive in congregate care. Um, because a lot of those services are, especially like residential treatment centers, they're more geared towards uh, those older teenage years. So it, it can be difficult for them to really uh, get the right services out of that setting. So treatment foster care really offers a good setting for them. For gender, 60% um, are boys, 40% are girls. Uh, so mostly boys, I think when you look at a, a daily summary of it or you're looking monthly, it sort of fluctuates. Um, I think it typically leans more towards boys, but sometimes it sticks more towards 50-50. Uh, and then as terms of uh, race and ethnicity, 41% of children are Hispanic in treatment foster care. That's our biggest category followed by um, 34% being Anglo, and then 20% African American, and 5% all other races. Looking at prior living arrangement, I think this is really important to understand where these kids are coming from, because uh, it can give some really good insight as to why they're being recommended for uh, treatment foster care. Uh, one of the two things that I want to focus on is one, this largest category here, foster homes. Um, you know, when we're thinking about the story, it can be really difficult for a child who's in a home setting to, you know, have some very high needs. The foster parents are really struggling with that kid. And the next step for them is to go into uh, congregate care, which is a pretty restrictive setting. Um, and treatment foster care works really well as sort of a stopgap so that they can still stay in a home-like setting without going into congregate care. Um, so I really see treatment foster care as sort of this uh, stopgap transitional program that can sort of pivot them in a really good direction. 27% uh, are coming from congregate care. That sort of makes sense since treatment foster care and congregate care, it's meant to be a, sort of an equal service um, that we would hope would be able to replace more congregate care settings in the future. Hospitals, this includes both uh, medical, like um, physical hospital needs, as well as psychological hospital needs. So if they're coming out of a hospitalization, we've got uh, some kids coming out of kinship. So once again, you know, child's at grandma's house, grandma's really struggling with that child. And in order to, you know, help grandma out, make sure that she's able to take a break or able to keep that child in a home-like setting, move over into treatment foster care and, you know, have the child get the services there before hopefully going into a relative or kinship home. Then looking at most common strengths and traumas, most common 
strengths are vocational, community, spirituality. This is just sort of giving a good background on, you know, what are they, what are the children doing well with, and then what are they struggling with, which is most common traumas, uh, neglect trauma being the number one, followed by caregiver disruptions, dysfunctional family. And I do really want to focus on that caregiver disruptions one, because that's going to come up later in this when we're looking at outcomes. Next slide. So last year we did a treatment foster parent experience survey. And I think this was really revealing when we got these results back because it was the first time that we had in an aggregated sense, um, a really clear picture about how our treatment foster parents were feeling in this, in this program, as well as how their experience was with the kids and with the agencies that they were working with. And I, it, you know, this survey reflected it for sure, but I think just in general, like Lauren said, this is a huge team effort and our treatment foster care providers just go above and beyond to meet the service needs for these kids. And it's just incredible what they do. Um, so, you know, looking at the top, top right of the slide, it, it really shows it, right? We took a look at how supported these foster parents felt. Uh, with various services, whether they felt like it was the services they received through the agency was adequate. Um, the lowest possible score was a one, highest possible score is a five. And you'll see like down the line for all agencies, it's sitting at, you know, pretty much mid, mid like 4.5 or above. The only one that was a little lower was transportation, which I know transportation services can kind of be hard no matter what, no matter what placement setting. Um, but it really goes to show just how much support these foster parents are getting, how hard our agencies are working to make sure that this program does well, uh, which I think is really, really impressive. Uh, the other thing that I thought was fascinating from this survey is we asked treatment foster parents whether they were likely to continue in the program as well as whether they were likely to recommend the program to other foster parents. Uh, and this was interesting because when you look at the likeliness to continue treatment foster care, over 50% of respondents said, yes, we want to keep doing treatment foster care. Um, this is definitely, I'm going to stay in this program. And then if you go to up to very likely, including extremely likely, you're going past 75%. That's a huge portion of treatment foster parents that want to stay in the program. It doesn't transfer, however, to whether they want to recommend the program. You'll see that you know, over 50% suddenly drops down to 25%. Uh, and when you're looking at extremely likely versus very likely, less than 50% of foster parents were willing to recommend this program. Uh, and as part of the survey, there was an open-ended response. So for the treatment foster parents that said that they weren't as likely to recommend the program, pretty much across the board, foster parents were talking about you know, this is a very, this work is hard. It takes a lot of effort and flat out, you know, some foster parents are just not cut out for it. It takes a lot out of these foster parents to be able to be there for the kids, get them the services that they need. Um, and they, they just realize like a lot of people just don't have the capacity to do that. And, um, you know, I think this is just part of that picture that says, you know, when we're looking at a program like this and we see these really positive outcomes, you know, we heard those personal stories about um, how these kids were doing, we might look at that and go, well, if this is going great, then why don't we just implement it all over the place and then everybody's going to be doing it. Well, it's not that easy, right? Uh, when you have a program that's really, really hard for the people, you know, boots on the ground doing it, um, I think it's a really good perspective to keep in mind when we want to grow this program, when we want to um, enhance the services, is that it is a lot of work. And it takes, like we've said before, it's a group effort. And I think this really showcases just how much work this program takes. Next slide. So then we're going to be looking at program outcomes. This is going to be sort of our meat and potatoes as far as the numbers go. Um, when we look at these trends, we're gonna be comparing treatment foster care to our residential treatment center, so the RTCs. Um, and the reason why we do this is we talk a lot about how treatment foster care is meant to be sort of an alternative to congregate care, almost like a replacement program for it um, with the Family First Act. We do wanna move more into home-like settings. So when we're evaluating whether treatment foster care is doing well, um, the sort of go-to cohort is going to be for the residential treatment centers because we want to see, is this a program that could potentially replace the RTC program? 
um, or at least take on a lot of the population that these RTCs take. I do want to caveat, you'll see the little note uh, down below, this is not a matched outcome analysis. Um, you might be asking, well, what the heck does that mean? It means that we are not controlling for certain factors in the analysis to make it truly, truly comparable in the best sense. That means um, when we're looking at RTCs, we have like thousands of kids and RTCs with very, very a wide range of characteristics and you know various demographics. And, and then you look at treatment foster care and we have a very, very small subset of our um, foster kids that are in that uh, placement setting. So when we're looking at the comparison between the two, it's really hard to make sure that the, the cohorts look identical in terms of the child characteristics. Um, so we're just going with the whole batch of treatment foster care kids versus the whole batch of RTC kids, which means that there may be certain controls that we are not adding into this analysis. So it can't be taken as a one-to-one. -one. Um, so just keep that in mind when we're looking at these numbers, just a little bit of a caveat. So there's three things that we're going to be looking at for this. Um, placement stability. So that's talking about how long is the child in their placement? Are they moving around all over the place? Uh, we're looking at positive exits from care. And we're looking at a cost benefit analysis. And I'll, I'll go into why we're doing that as we get there. So next slide. So the first part is we're looking at placement stability. So length of stay. Um, so overall, we found that treatment foster care children were more likely to stay in their placement for a longer period compared to RTC children. I do want to say when we're looking at these days, um, you know, Lauren talked about earlier that it's a nine to 12 month program. If you see length of stay that's longer than nine to 12 months, it's typically you can get an extension for the program and stay longer. So some of those longer stays do relate to, to those placement extensions. Um, and you can see a pretty considerable difference in these charts, right, when we're looking at, um, you know, what percentage of all treatment foster care, what percentage of all residential treatment children um, were in, in the placement setting for a certain amount of days. Uh, and you'll see that 65% of treatment foster care, care children were in their placement for five months or more. Uh, so when you're looking at this chart here, it's the, the bar that's 145 days to 215 days and then forward. Uh, and then you compare that to residential treatment where 46% of RTC children were in their placement for five months or more. And you can see in terms of how those charts look with the treatment foster care sort of going up as we get into those longer placement stays versus residential treatment really, really declining. So the, the highest portion, or at least in terms of category is that five to 75 days for residential treatment, which is a very, very short amount of time for a child to be staying in an RTC. Next slide. And then this is just a, an update. The last slide was 2021 outcomes. This is 2022. Um, same thing sort of we're seeing from the last slide, uh, treatment foster care once again having a lot more of those longer placement stays uh, compared to residential treatment where we're seeing that sharp decline in terms of uh, lengthier stays. Um, this one, the comparison, RTCs went up just a little bit in terms of their length of stay, but still 64% compared to 54%. That's still a 10% difference, which is pretty high. Um, and the reason we talk about placement disruptions is just how much of a negative impact they have on the kid. Uh, you know, one of the things that was talked about in the webinar video that we watched is it can be really hard for a child, let's say, they're moving placements, they have to change schools over and over. Um, they're constantly, you know, interacting with brand new caregivers that they're meeting for the first time. And it can be really, really hard for the child. There's a lot of negative impacts. Uh, you know, I think one of the things is they can feel isolated. They can feel like they can't trust their caregivers. They look at them and go, well, I'm only gonna see you for 20 days. So why does it matter if I get close to you or not? Um, so when we're looking for long-term positive outcomes, placement stability is really, really important, especially when we're dealing um, with a, you know, a foster care climate where we're really focusing on stopping that uh, you know, revolving door of kids going in and out of their placements. We want them to stay, right? Next slide. The next piece we're looking at here is positive versus negative discharge reasons. So we're looking at when a child was discharged from their treatment foster care setting, um, were they being discharged for a positive reason or were, were they being discharged for a negative reason? Once again, comparing to residential treatment. 
Um, just for some context, positive discharge reasons, and this is not all of them, this is just a sample of them. They can include reunification, adoption, kinship placement, achieving their therapeutic goals, or they had a service level decrease. Uh, negative discharge reasons, those can include psychiatric hospitalization, runaways, child behavioral issues, or heightened safety risk. Uh, when I say child behavioral issues, that can either mean um, it was the, the behaviors were getting to a point where it just didn't match with what the foster parents were, you know, originally intending to um, take on for, you know, the child that they were caring for, or it could mean that the foster parent is just overwhelmed and they can't do it. Um, there's a lot of it, child behavioral issues is a pretty wide net in terms of what it encompasses. So when we took a look at this, like this is this is substantial, right? Um, in terms of positive versus negative discharge reasons, treatment foster care had a 20% increase in positive discharge reasons, which is crazy. Um, so we're overall seeing that treatment foster care, when children are leaving treatment foster care, they're leaving far more often for better reasons than when they're leaving a residential treatment center setting. So um, much, much better that we're seeing out of treatment foster care compared to RTCs in this case. Next slide. So now we're gonna be looking at costs. And like I said, there's a reason why I'm including the cost of the program in this is, um, you know, when you work in public service, uh, we're sort of limited by our funding. We are not um, these, like we're not Google with like an unlimited piggy bank of money. Um, so when we use our money, we have to make sure that we're spending it in, in you know, the most efficient way to get the best outcomes possible for children. We do have limitations on that. So I do want to talk about the cost because this is another piece of the picture of, well, why aren't we just doing treatment foster care everywhere as much as we possibly can? It's expensive, right? Um, so when we're looking at state cost of services for child, um, the daily rate for treatment foster care is flat out $277.73, whereas residential treatment, it's a little trickier for comparison because residential treatment centers can take a variety of different children with a variety of different needs. So the daily rate for them can range anywhere from $45 up to $459 per child per day. And that is a large range in terms of you might have a child that's placed in an RTC that has, you know, uh, sort of minimal, uh, minimal service needs, but let's say it's a, um, they're being placed with their sibling. We want to keep the sibling group together, um, but their specific daily rate is a little bit lower compared to maybe the $459 uh, per child per day might be like a child specific contract, which is you know, being charged at a completely different rate. There's a lot of different reasons why the, the price may vary, but we're seeing overall, um, this is, by the way, this is the state cost of services for the, the child's entire stay for the placement. So we're seeing for the RTCs, there's far fewer that are costing sort of in that upper range when we're getting up to like the 46K forward. Um, compared to treatment foster care, where we're still seeing a pretty sizable portion of children um, having their placement stay cost in the, the upper tiers comparative wise. Um, but there is a positive on that. And you'll see treatment foster care costs roughly 38,000 on average compared to 21,000 for RTCs. Um, but there's a benefit, like I said. So let's go to the next slide. So what I did is a cost benefit analysis. So when we do this, we're trying to answer the question, okay, when we spend this amount of money for residential treatment, and then we increase to this amount of money for treatment foster care, what additional benefits are we getting for that money? So I took the average cost per child, the average length of stay and percentage of positive discharges, because we were sort of focusing on those two as our indicators for how, what outcomes were happening. So the difference in cost was $17,000. The difference in the average length of stay was about 46 days. And the percentage of positive discharges was about a 20% difference. So when we look at what the change was from residential treatment up to treatment foster care, this means for about a 24% in the increase of cost, we're getting a 32.2% length of stay increase and a 44.4 positive exit increase, which is huge. That's, that's almost 50% uh, when we're talking about the additional benefit we're getting out of treatment foster care compared to residential treatment. 
Um, so when we're talking about return on investment, which I know can be kind of difficult to talk about when this is, it, it's um, the context of the experience for the children is so important. And I do want to focus more on that. This is more of the, um, you know, the financial dollars and cents piece is the return on investment in terms of the child's experience and outcomes is so substantially better when we're investing a little extra money on this. And I know like when we're looking at the thousands of dollars, it can be kind of hard to conceptualize this, but when we're talking long-term in a large system, overall, the outcomes are much better just from the extra dollars we're spending on this. Next slide. And then I will pass it off to Dr. Jackson. Good afternoon. I think we're in afternoon time now. Um, my name is Dr. Valerie Jackson. I am the founder as well as the program uh, administrator for Monarch Family Services. Uh, Monarch has been around since uh, 2014. We started off as a kinship agency and we are continuing to expand upon our model uh, to offer families uh, the opportunity to, uh, to take care of their, the children that have child welfare involvement and vice versa, the children being able to be um, with their family of origin. And so we believe through this expansion program, we're more likely to serve more families um, and more children. Cause we, we do, we serve the caregiver in our model, we serve the caregiver and the children uh, essentially equally as far as giving uh, supportive care and services to them. Um, so we'll more likely keep these families together as well as get them the services and support that is needed. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so our philosophy is that children belong with their, their families of origin, their biological families, whether it is through uh, kinship care or maybe a return home or reunification with the biological parents. And so if, but if we also understand that a lot of kids um, are unable to return to the biological parents. Here in the state, we have about a 38% return to, um, to biological families. But our kinship care program is on the rise. And so uh, more family, more children are being connected with uh, kinship or fictive kin relatives and are thriving in those homes. And so as we look at the vision of kinship treatment foster care, these are children that have higher level of needs uh, as well as uh, the, they have been determined that either they um, uh, are qualified for residential treatment uh, or they have had a history of, of psych psychiatric hospitalization. And so what we wanna do is, uh, is, again, maintain their connection and their placement with their family of origin, uh, but also provide the needed and necessary support uh, to these families. And just a disclaimer, uh, we are awarded this, uh, this contract. However, we've been conducting these level of services since the beginning. This, by having uh, the treatment family foster care contract is just allowing us to compensate more to our families. But as far as the treatment model, we have, uh, we have at least about um, nine years of experience implementing it. Um, and myself, I'm a clinical psychologist, and so I've been working um, with children in care for 24 years. And so we, we do have a, um, a well, and kinship is our focus, it's our, it's our love. And so we just, we're very happy to be able to expand out uh, these more uh, uh, financial supports to the families. We can go to the next slide. So the model basically, um, when we, we're talking about diverting children, uh, caregivers essentially from uh, not being able to provide the, um, the, the care and support to these children. What we have been providing caregivers is parent coaching. We, uh, we have really developed that model over the years and we see it as one of our strongest support systems to individualize parent coaching uh, by either one of our team professionals, which are either LPC or psychologists, or some, uh, we have had enough um, kinship caregivers that uh, have gone through our program, been successful with stabilizing the children, and now they're peer coaches to some of our, our new families that are taking on these challenges. And so, um, and also a, a group, we do family group counseling with our, um, our parents. So we, we work together as a team so that we can come up with solutions as a team. 
um, placement. So uh, placement is children are typically placed in the home already, but in some cases we have children that have been through the foster care system and through efforts of case mining that we do here at the agency, we have identified relative caregivers that maybe years ago weren't considered, but now with the new policies and push for, for kinship caregivers, we are able to now um, get, them, get them started with the licensing process. And now they are able to become the, uh, the treatment, uh, the TFFC caregiver for these kids. And so, um, and so we, uh, we go in and we just, we, we load them with services. Uh, network meetings are helped to introduce the whole team because a lot of when we're working with kinship, they're like, oh, these people are in my home, uh, especially when we're working with older grandmothers. Uh, they don't know who they are or what's their role. So we, we, have, we have a team network meeting with everyone that's involved with the kinship family and that's going to be involved with the youth so that all members are uh, present and, and they know what their role is in this paradigm. If we have a placement breakdown, and honestly, in the last few years, we have less than a 1% placement breakdown in our kinship homes. But uh, if we have a placement breakdown or our potential breakdown, then we have a network meeting. Again, all, all hands on deck, all members that are involved um, in that child and youths and family's life. We all get on a meeting. We go, most of the time we hold it in person and we try to figure out a plan to keep this family together. Because again, this is a long-term, I mean, short-term and a long-term plan because all of our families that are go through the program, they, are, uh, they end up adopting the child or go through PMC with PCA uh, uh, or, or get PMC with PCA. Um, oh, next slide. So this is the treatment model. So we do recognize that there are needs and challenges that these children have. So we do, because we're a kinship program, we really, really, really hone in on these existing relationships with family. And uh, we want to reduce the risk that they don't have to go outside of their family unit uh, in order to get stabilization and healing and care. And so we, we do our best to keep the, this uh uh, family together. Also, we understand that these kinship caregivers most of the time don't have time to plan. Um, even when we have placement already in existence, we, uh, we still understand that this is an unexpected thing. They didn't uh, volunteer initially just to go through this licensing process, have all this CPS involvement. And so we're very, very sensitive and compassionate, put compassionate when we're teaching and instructing about the the um, this licensing process or the logistics to this, and so we we instantly build rapport, create a loyal um, relationship with these caregivers, and we make things as simple as possible. And so, uh, like I stated earlier, sometimes we have to go search for uh, relative caregivers from the past, or we'll do some case mining to, to identify even connections. Maybe it's not the person that we're calling, but they know of other people within the family unit to connect these, these children to. And so we, 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 we exhaust efforts to try to get these uh, children connected with families of origin. And so uh, here at Monarch, we have a very robust therapeutic program. Um, we have many psychologists and, and licensed professional counselors and licensed social workers and uh, mental and uh, behavior specialists that work for the agency. So the good thing about uh, families that work here and work with us, they get all of their services in house. We rarely have to outsource any any services. So that's why the team and the, the team effort is, is very uh, important. Yet also is uh, it's a lot of continuity of care because all of the providers are here uh, and work for Monarch. Kinship, caregiving, parenting, coaching, like I said, that's one of our key elements with, uh, with sustaining these homes or st stabilizing and then sustaining these homes. And so we get the, the assigned parent coach, uh, again, could be either one of our professional staff that meet with the family for the first six weeks. They can meet once a week or several times a week, but it has to be in person. And during this, these sessions with our parent coaches or sometimes it's the peer parent coach, they educate them on the licensing process, uh, look at, looking at the family genogram and, and eco mapping to see with all the supports that are around them and what, is, what are the supports that they're needing. When I say supports, I'm talking about social support. So an active social support, supports that they can have, have access to. Um, also trauma-informed parenting, managing changes within the family dynamics. Also integration of trauma-informed parenting uh, styles and basic child development. 
and also effectively addressing child's problematic behavior. So we we don't take it on a general. The, the reason was individualized parent culture because we're going we're dealing we're addressing issues that they see that they're dealing with and coming up with plans to to address those problems. Sometimes those plans work, so then we go back to the table. Even though uh, we say six weeks, we've had some families that take advantage of our parent coaching program for several months until they're able to really get a rhythm of how this, um, how, how they, they can control some of this uh, behavior and also how to help the child. And also we, we have a lot of hone in on self-care to the, to the caregiver because we, we encourage a lot of self-care uh, strategies and methods because we understand if the caregiver is not healthy, if the caregiver is not stable, then they have a very hard time taking care of the troubled child. Um, and so also we have a 24 hour action team. And so, and that's just a crisis intervention team that consists of our LPC, our licensed, uh, our licensed psychologist, as well as a clinical director and our parent coach, and they assign parent coach. It's always the same parent coach that works with them from the beginning. They, they work with them all the way through. And we try to keep that, that consistency with the parent coach as well as a family support specialist, who's also known as a caseworker all the way through. We try not to uh, introduce too many people uh, to the family and, and keep everything consistent. Also a lot of life, we give a lot of licensing support because we know that's a very arduous process. And so we give so much support towards the licensing process. All right, we can next slide. And we're not gonna go over this, but this is just a checklist when planning uh, a kinship treatment initiatives. This is for uh, other, this is the, the checklist that we utilize when we were really strategizing on the, 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 pro, the, the treatment program. And this is uh, also a good, helpful, helpful uh, strategy for other agencies that want to adopt the kinship treatment uh, uh, family foster care model as well. Uh, we can go to the next slide for the sake of time. All right, so uh, the implementation model for our treatment family foster care um, is that we first identify or identify the, the family either through CPS or sometimes they're referred to us um, by, uh, or they're self-referred, they, they, they hear about the agency. And so we schedule a meeting inside the home or virtually depending on their comforts. And we go over the kinship uh, TFC uh, program and include the, uh, including the licensing process, our curriculum, we uh, introduce our parent coach at that time, also the case manager that will be working with them from beginning till, till consummation or PMC, and also the financial incentives. Once the family has agreed to the service, we uh, begin the home verification process, but they start working with the case management team and the parent coaching immediately. So upon, uh, after that orientation, they start working with that, uh, those, those, that, those two team members immediately. We connect them to psychological services, uh, additional, we have a, a, a case manager here that that's all she does is re, uh, referral, re, uh, provide referrals, internal referrals, as well as community referrals, whatever is needed. Because um, we do take care of basic needs here. We have a grant here that we do take care of basic needs, such as rent assistance or, or any type of uh, home modifications and stuff like that. Um, they also are introduced to the MAT team, which is our crisis intervention team, and though they can access them 24 hours. Anytime people will be dispatched out in the, in the event of a crisis. And also uh, we have network meetings every 60 days. This is outside the service plan meetings. This is just a bit to, to really get, uh, make sure that they have, they feel supported in this process by us, but also who they've identified within their ecosystem as their support system and making sure that those people are in place. Uh, and then we also, um, um, first 90 days, uh, we have the case management trainings and we try to get them licensed within 90 days so that they can start the, the financial incentive. But again, programming starts on day one. As soon as we say hi and we, we uh, schedule orientation, the program piece begins. And so upon the completion of the licensing process, the beauty of this program is that 99% um, of the time, the children go nowhere. They transition either to adoption uh, with that family or uh, they will foster for a couple more months um, before placing on the doc docket for adoption or PMC with PCA. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just the services real quick. Um, so we see that the youth get services. And of course, I said the big piece is the caregiver gets services. And these are the assigned professionals, uh, family support specialists. We have eight to choose from. And so they again, they get signed on day one. They stick with them all the way to consummation or PMC. Uh, we have a behavior specialist, a family therapist that only does uh, two options for family therapists. 
uh, since we have so many P uh, LPCs and licensed social workers here on staff, we um, they can it can be a number of people that do individual therapy. We perform our assessment by administering the child behavior checklist when we first uh, interact with the the parent. And every uh, 30 days, we have the parent to uh, complete the child behavior checklist to see if we're making any if there's any improvement based on the parent coaching that they're getting the therapy, uh, individual therapy, family therapy, behavioral um, behavioral specialist. So we do um, we do do this assessment to see uh, progress. Also community events. Uh, we have community events every single quarter. That's to bring all families together so they can meet each other, become each other's, again, ecosystem <laughs> and provide that level of support also for respite uh, if ever needed. And so we do have quarterly community events uh, and agency events to, to make that camaraderie. And now on the left side is our kinship caregiver um, program. And so kinship caregiver, of course, gets that family support specialist from beginning until consummation or our, our, our PMC. Parent coach, our parent coach is uh, Althea Lacewell. Um, she has underneath her uh, leadership, a few peer parent coaches. So it means kinship caregivers that have gotten PMC, they're gone, but they, they want to volunteer. So they do work with some of our families uh, that are new to this. Uh, family therapists, as well as uh, we offer family therapy, as well as individual therapy to our caregivers. Uh, also extensive trainings, multiple trainers on that. We have parenting classes for them, but it's upon request. We have a whole respite care program, uh, self, self care quarterly sessions, because again, we have a strong belief on the self care aspect of, um, of, of the caregiver. And Dr. Marsha Chen facilitates that. We have a monthly parenting support group, uh, again, the crisis intervention team and the community resource, uh, premium resources always given by our case. Uh, resource manager, Tiffany Tran. And I want you to see and notice like how the kinship caregiver has more resources even than the youth, because again, the kinship caregiver is the healing agent for the youth. So since they're the, the, the catalyst to healing, we wanna make sure they get everything they need in order to be that daily support and healing agent for that youth. Uh, next slide, please. And this, this is just the, the general model um, of our program and also the end of my portion of the presentation. Thank you for your time um, and I pass it off. All right, well done, Dr. Jackson. I'm gonna, I'm gonna e echo a lot of what you said. Um, my name is Michael Scrivener. I'm the senior director of, at CK, as you can see. We've been one of the TFFC contractors and child placing agencies uh, since the program started back in 2017 and 2018. Um, we made our first placement in the fall of 2018. Uh, just, I know there's a lot of people on this um, webinar today from all over the state. So we, we operate at CK in region three, which is uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area and the, the 19 surrounding counties there. Uh, we provide this program both directly to the department and we work with one of the SSCCs that is in region three as well. And we're excited that this year in 2023, we're beginning to expand southward into region seven uh, with a special grant we got through the department. So that's exciting work as, as, as well. What I really wanna take the time to talk to you guys about is how can you in your role as a part of the judicial system and uh, the advocates and the, the court side of the child's team make a difference in partnering with treatment family foster care. So in our experience of doing this, we've really gotten to see a lot of um, different outcomes. And so I think we can all agree that we're wanting to achieve success. And the best way to achieve success is to be prepared. And so similar to what Dr. Jackson expressed, that has everything to do with the family, whether that is an adoptive family, whether it's a kinship family, whether it's reunification, um, if we expect that child to succeed, they have to go into a stable environment that is prepared for them and that is ready. You, you guys heard on the, uh, on the video um, a little bit of some of the things I've uh, gotten to speak on in the past, and, and it is one of my soapboxes. Um, it frustrates me when I get into meetings, when we talk about the child, if when the child's ready, we'll move on. Um, it, it has nothing to do with the child being ready. It's have we found a responsible, loving, caring adult who understands what this child has been through, who understands how to meet the child's trauma needs 
and who has the support around them to be able to make that commitment and do, do that. So the, at CK, our model, we follow um, a national evidence-based practice called wraparound. Um, and that model basically focuses on the voice and choice of the permanency family. So again, regardless of who that is, we want them to get involved in the program as quickly as they can. And, and you heard in, in Lauren's presentation um, in the slide that part of this program, the goal is to identify who is that permanency family the child's going to go to within 30 days of their entrance in, into the program, because it is a time-based program. And I'm sure many of you have gotten the opportunity to experience in the work you've done thus far that the breakdowns often are due to the fact the adults in the room can't get along, not because of the children at all. So what we really want to do is pull that team together and get all of the adults working together, break down the silos from the, you know, CASA and the judicial side, with the attorneys and the judges to the DFPS workers, to the child placing agency, to, to the service providers that are in the, in the community, whether it be therapy or behavioral health skills training, all those amazing services that these children get, they're only as good as all of us coming together and making sure we're all on the same page. And if it doesn't translate to that permanency family being a part of that process with us and learning what they can do when the child comes to live with them and getting to practice that, which is what really treatment family care provides an opportunity for that, like no other program that the state offers. Let me give you an, an example. Uh, we want to identify that person as quickly as possible, and then we want to practice. So I will often say things like, okay, we've identified grandma as who, um, you know, our child is going to go to. How fast can we get to unsupervised visits with grandma? What is the barrier to that happening? Um, what is she doing to um, work on that if the department has concerns, if the court has concerns? What can we do to get her the support services needed to overcome that and to get to that as quickly as possible? Because if we only have nine months, I really want grandma to get as much practice with the child in her home as we can get in that brief time frame. And so um, our service provides 24-7 crisis support, and our services are also available to that uh, permanency family. So if grandma wants parenting skill training, we can do that. We want grandma to be a part of the process with us as quickly as possible in our monthly child and family team meetings. We have those meetings every month where we pull the whole team together, the, the CASA worker, the, the attorney, the, uh, you know, the case manager from the agency, the therapist, everyone that's a part of that child's team is invited to be a part of that meeting every month. And it's vital that we have those meetings and those meetings are, are geared toward the child and the permanency family having a large part of that meeting to share what they're learning, what they feel is going well, what they need more help with. Okay, it's not just about the adult saying this is what we think is best for you, child. This is what you're going to do. It's about what is that family actually learning to implement. So back to the example of grandma. I want grandma to get unsupervised visits as quickly as possible because guess what? We will extend our 24-7 crisis support to grandma when the child goes to her home to visit for that unsupervised weekend visit. We want her to have that support so she knows what to do. We want her to be in those monthly meetings so she can talk to the current foster parents. What is working right now that I can begin to, to implement on my, on my visits, that I can implement when the child comes to live with me? Um, it's really all about transferring those skills and empowering those permanency providers to be able to do that. And that is where you as the court system can have the biggest impact. You as, as the CASA advocate, you as the attorney, first and foremost, we want you as a part of those meetings. We want you to be an active member of the child's team. Don't play into the silos. Don't play into, I just do my part over here. Come and invest and be a part of the team because that is what produces that positive outcome. All of us preparing together to help that permanency family. It breaks down if we have differences of, of opinion. It, it lets us work through any, any barriers that, that we see, and it really helps produce that positive outcome. Um, one, of the, one of the slides and one of the things that Lauren mentioned earlier 
It's just allowing time for this work to be done. That is another one of the barriers that we have that you can directly impact. I know that, that, that the judicial side and legal system wants to be as efficient and quickly as possible. We do not want the state raising children, but often if we rush to place, we have not done all that preparation work that I just talked about. So I'll give you an, an example. We had one of our own CK cases. Um, it was a young, a young boy who was nine years old. He had done very well in his treatment family home. He, had, he was showing improvement and they did not have a permanency option for him. All of a sudden, a permanency option opened up with a family member and that family member was gonna take this child and was gonna take a sibling of, of this child. And it moved very quickly through the court system, like immediately within a month of us learning about this person, we were already at a timetable and, and a date for both children to go live with that parent. The parent did not get the opportunity to continue to engage with us, to continue to be a part of, of learning all the things that have been done. We didn't get a chance to do home visits where we could support them and try this out and make sure that it's working well. And we know that those, those failures do happen, sadly. We wanna find out if it's gonna fail when we have the support of the program, not after the program, okay? Um, and unfortunately, the decision was made. The child and his sibling were taken uh, and placed with um, the family member. And within 24 hours, the family member drove those children back to a DFPS office and dropped them off. And, and I think that is squarely the result of all of us as a team not preparing that parent for what it was going to be like to have those kids. She brought them in. They were hard kids. The siblings had not been placed together in foster care, so their first chance to be together was back in reunification. <laughs> it was a lot, as you can imagine. And she just felt like she couldn't do it. And she panicked and she dropped the children back off. So we, we really need, and you can have a tremendous impact from your role on the legal side as to advocating for, let's let this program run its course. Let this program do what it's designed to do. Let's give that permanency parent a chance to practice. Let's give all the professionals that are involved on this team a chance to assess that permanency parent's, that permanency parent's readiness. So it, you know, that is where I can see you guys having the biggest bang um, and the biggest impact. And so um, that, you know, I want I want to be brief and, and respect our our time. So I, I'm going to end. But but thank you for what you do. Please understand the role you have and understand how you can impact it. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for an excellent presentation. We do have a little bit of time left for questions. So I'm going to uh, read the questions that we've com had come in so far. Uh, the first question is regarding LBG, LBGT youth. Um, and anecdotally, you've seen rights of LGBTQ plus youth uh, going to CWAP or having a harder time finding placements. Is there any data or anecdotal information about LBGT youth being placed in treatment finally foster care? I can, I can give you anecdotal data just from uh, CK's experience in, in the program. We have served several uh, children that identify as LGBT. And for us, it's all about making the right match for that child, providing a, a home, a treatment parent for that child that is going to be able to support that child and, and going to be able to help that child get access to the resources they need. Um, and we also train every one of our foster parents to, to understand that things happen with these children that we don't know about. Um, so even though it may not be discussed in that initial match process, you may have a child in your home that over the time that they're in your home, they begin to uh, open up and feel comfortable enough now and secure enough to share that they are having questions about their sexuality or their identity or any number of things. And so we, we prepare our families that you have to be prepared to meet the child where they are. Um, I like to use the missionary um, analogy that a missionary goes and gets into the culture of the people that they're serving. They don't say you're going to come to me and do everything my way. So your treatment family home has to be, have that missionary mindset that you're stepping into the culture of trauma 
you're stepping into the the culture of abuse and neglect and you're you're stepping into meeting those children and those families as a whole where they where they are so we have had very positive outcomes with the lgbt youth we've served we have not had um for example lgbt youth um, discharged from homes just because they um, identify that way or families feeling overwhelmed that they didn't know how to meet their needs thank you michael does anyone else have anything they want to add to that Well, Monarch has a inclusive policy. So um, we, when we have those cases, and again, we're solely a, a kinship caregiver. So they already know, you know, what they are about their relative and they already are aware. So we just support that, um, that those, those, um, those type of relationships. And also uh, we do have a LGBTQ support group uh, every Friday. And they meet here. We have uh, and it's for uh, ages uh, 13 to 18, and they meet every meet here every Friday. And they um, they it's a peer support. It's peer led, but also, uh, Dr. Marsha Chen is the one that it facilitates it. But uh, there, so we do actually have that uh, service available here. And in, in the while the, the peers are meeting, uh, sometimes the parents will meet in a separate room and just discuss any ish, you know, any anything. They'll just discuss any topics. Sometimes it's just socializing and just getting familiar with each other. But but we do offer that every Friday um, at 6, 6.30 to, uh, to 8 at Monarch. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, I think we had another question that I think may have been um, directed to your presentation, Dr. Jackson. You mentioned, I think, families and, and kinship, uh, treatment family foster care getting together quarterly. And there's a question, is, does that mean families from all over the state? Does it mean from different regions? Or how, how is that getting together working? Okay, so we are in Region 6. We're located in Region 6. We do have, and the quarterly was the events. So in uh, first quarter, we usually ho host a crawfish boil. For, uh, for our families. So they'll come to the crawfish boil. Quarter two, we host a, a picnic. And so uh, actually our, pic our agency picnic is June, uh, the first week in June, I, I think it's June 4th, if I'm not mistaken. So June 4th, no, June 3rd, sorry. June 3rd is our family picnic. And so that we usually have about uh, close to 200 families show up for that picnic. Um, and that, that's a great network um, opportunity. And, um, and in quarter three, we have a back to school around September. And then finally quarter, quarter four, we have a Christmas celebration um, where we give out gifts, gift certificates, prizes, also gifts to the caregivers. Cause again, we really, and most of the caregivers gifts are like self care stuff. Cause we just really believe in like strong emphasis on taking care of yourself so that you can take care of the other. And, um, and so yeah, that's the quarterly. And so it is in, it's region specific. And it is uh, in person. Now, our month, our uh, support groups are via Zoom. Parenting classes are via Zoom, as well as uh, parent coaching is in person because um, it's important for the parent coaching to be in person. And, and we, we do offer therapies via Zoom or in person or at the office. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, and, and a follow up to that what services and options are available for kinship who are out of state to become kinship uh, treatment family foster programs? Uh, if the if the child is out of state and but the family's in region six, very easy. <laughs> so we could just we could just uh, uh, create the IP, ICPC agreement and contract with uh, contract those services with that that state uh, directly with the agency and 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 uh, which we we have done uh, something similar California. Um, so we're able to to have that available. If the family is out of state, the child is in region six, uh, we, there's not much because they will have to go get that service from their state. However, we do, since, we, so, since our psychological services are for all children in CPS care, are, are even the broad population, we can, we can provide the psychological services to the child that is located here while they're waiting to, to uh, prepare to transfer to the, to the state of where their relatives reside. Thank you. Uh, we had a, another question regarding kinship, which was who pays for the parenting classes, particularly for grandparents. The questioner mentioned they've had struggles with DFPS getting you know parenting classes for grandparents in a normal uh, CPS case. So how how is the services provided to these families paid for? Well, um, the, the, it's fortunate for our families. We we just embedded it into the program, so it's just part of the program model. They can they can participate in the parenting classes and parenting coaching and parent coaching. 
uh, which is two different things. Parent coaching is individualized, parenting classes are group. So they participate in unlimited access to that uh, as long as they're affiliated with the agency because it's built into our program model. Uh, now we've had referrals from the department for uh, family members, uh, mostly biological parents, but sometimes it is a grandparent or aunt, be referred to our parenting classes, and that is a FIFA service. So um, in the department, we'll, we, we do have the contract evaluation and treatment contract. So the department is able to provide a 2054 um, um, in order for that service to be paid for by the department, because we do have the contract, the evaluation and treatment contract. So the department can't pay us FIFA service uh, because of the, the we do have, we hold the contract. Thank you. Uh, we have yet another question regarding kinship placement, a lot of interest in this particular topic. Um, but this one was regarding how can legal anticipate a placement to kinship to prepare for a child being ready to place there? I think the question is, oftentimes when children need to be placed, they need to be placed quickly. And this process is not a quick process. So how can legal sort of help prepare families who are interested in being placements for the service when the need may be very immediate, but the process may take a long time. Right. So just being active on the team, like I said, there's a lot of network meet. We do a lot of network meetings here. So just being present most of the time, again, kinship families, it is immediacy. It's, everything's immediacy when you work with them. It, they immediately receive the placement, but they need immediate support. And so that's why we don't wait for the licensing process to complete before we uh, fill that home with services. For the caregiver, you saw the caregiver's list is a little longer than the, the youth's list because the caregiver, again, is the catalyst to healing. And so we try to fully prepare them to, to be that, to be just that and be strong enough to be just that. And so, um, so it's just the immediacy of support and services. Um, I know there's been some discussions uh, about provisional licensing for kinship caregivers that's still in discussion, nothing that has been solidified, but that is that would also be a great avenue for this, especially the kinship caregivers with children with high levels of needs, not having, you know, meeting the minimum requirement uh, for that provisional license and going through the licensing process would be extremely ideal. But it's not, like I said, still in discussion. Uh, but what attorneys can do is just advocate uh, that, uh, that, we, that they get all the services and support that they need outside of the agency that they're working with if they need additional things. Um, and also um, just be present. That's what a lot of my families talk about. The attorney, you know, they, they know the name of the attorney, but they don't know the attorneys uh, for the children or the guardian ad litems as much. So just be present. Having that extra presence of support that they know that you are an advocate that can definitely, uh, you talk about that ecosystem, be a part of their ecosystem of support, and then they will feel like they can do this. <laughs> Just be present. Thank you. Uh, I, I was thinking another instance of that may be when a child is in an RTC and they're looking for a, a transition placement, getting kinship involved early on to become oh, yeah. a kinship treatment foster placement may be a good way for that child to absolutely from an RTC. That, um, that, that's, that's brilliant, actually, to have a, 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 the waiting as they transition out to be a already licensed uh, KTFFC home. And already get, like I said, the, the caregiver is already getting support even before the kid gets there so they can be prepared. So yes. Dylan, I, I, I would add to that. One of the struggles we have in the system with kinship right now is that the, the kinship family is the one that's really in the driver's seat. Some of them will want to pursue licensure like, like, like Dr. Valerie's talking about that. And, and we, we, we certainly have that option as well. Most of your CPAs are in the works of, of developing some type of a kinship program. But the other caveat is we have lots of families out there that don't want to get licensed because they view that as part of the system. And they say, I don't want the system in my life anymore. <laughs> and so we're, we're working on special contracts um, and creative revenue streams as well to provide services to those families that are outside of the foster care system. We can only provide foster care services and that revenue if they become a licensed foster parent. But if they choose not to do that, what can we still support them with? Like Dr. Dr. Valley talks about, they, they jump right in from the very beginning. We're in the process and a lot of the CPAs are on the ACR as well, exploring what are those revenue streams, whether it be through private insurance or it be through Medicaid services or it be through anything, what can we do to get services to those families uh, if they don't want to be um, licensed. And so what I would encourage is the, the the court and the legal system to be just having those conversations with that child's team to see how we can best support them. And in present day, only 5% of kinship families that have system involvement are getting licensed. So it's about 5 to 6%. 
So that means that we're, you're working with like 96% of people, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm doing my math wrong, but 95% to 94% of kinship families not going through the licensing process. Uh, you asked me, what do I, should I tell the legal community? They need to educate themselves on the licensing process so they can communicate that. Because remember, they're the advocate. They're the, they're the one, the, the trusting person in the case. So in order for them to, to be able to educate the families and encourage more families to go through the licensing process, they need to be educated and trained on what that involves, entails, the, the benefits, uh, as well as some of the sacrifices that come with that, because they have to sacrifice their time for training and all those other things. But, but, um, but I really, I think that there's not enough um, knowledge about the licensing process by the legal community and understanding what's about, so they can communicate that to get to get that five percent, five to six percent of relative caregivers access in this uh, licensing process. Uh, get that up. We need to we need to work together to get that that rate up, that number up, because they're foregoing it more and more for going the licensing process. And most of it's out of lack of knowledge and fear, so. Thank you so much for raising that important point, Dr. Jackson. Uh, I see that we're, we're nearly out of time and I think we've answered all of the questions that are in the q and I don't know if any of our viewers have any last questions, um, but if not, I just want to thank all our viewers for the wonderful questions they did submit. I want to thank our speakers uh, for their efforts to get this information available in a very easy to understand way. Uh, Lauren Morgan, Caroline Sinha, Dr. Jackson, Michael Scribner, we really appreciate you putting this presentation together. Um, we will uh, post uh, this webcast and we'll archive it along with all the slides. Uh, people ask that several times during the question. All the slides will be available on the Children's Commission website uh, along with the archive presentation. And we will send out an announcement to everyone when that information has been posted. I wanna thank everyone for viewing our webcast.